Good evening. I'm Ken Taylor, cultural producer now for the British Library, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's event, Digital Nature. It's part of our wider natural world season of events, which reflect on the urgent need to reimagine our relationship with the environment. And it's also part of our growing cultural programme from the Leeds region, where we have one of the British Library's two sites. I'll hand you over shortly to our event chair, but first, just some brief housekeeping notes. We'll have an audience question and answer segment towards the end of the event. So we do encourage you to send any questions you have for the panelists in throughout using the question function you'll see below your, this window on your screen. And we'll do our best to answer them at the end. We also encourage you to tell us what you thought of the event afterwards using the feedback link that you'll find above this window. I'll now hand you over to Irini Papadimitriou, our event chair. Irini is a curator and is currently creative director of Future Everything having previously been Digital Programs Manager at the VNA and Head of New Media Arts Development at Waterman's. Irini. Thank you, Ken. It's a great pleasure to be here um, and I'm looking forward to our conversation today and good evening to everyone in our audience. So uh, before saying more about uh, our theme for, for this evening's conversation, I would like to introduce our brilliant panelists. So I'm very pleased to welcome um, Ben Eaton from uh, Invisible Flock, an award-winning uh, interactive art studio based at the uh, beautiful Yorkshire Sculpture Park and um, Invisible Flock work across uh, art and technology and create uh, sensory installations and environments uh, asking us to renegotiate our emotional relationship to the natural world. And their aim is to open up critically uh, important ways of thinking about how we live, how we connect and share to live better together in a global society. Uh, I'm also pleased to have here tonight, Dr. Uh, Sue Thomas, a uh, writer and visit visiting fellow at Bournemouth University. And Sue was professor of new media at the Montfort University between 2005 and 2013. And her books uh, include Nature and Wellbeing in the Digital Age, uh, Technobiophilia, Nature and Cyberspace, Hello World, Travels in Virtuality, and Correspondence, which was uh, shortlisted for the Arthur C. Clarke Award for Best Science Fiction Novel. And Sue is currently writing a new novel called The Fault in Reality, which sounds fascinating. Uh, welcome, uh, Sue, and welcome, um, Ben. And uh, last but definitely not least, we have Cyril Teep, uh, who is uh, the British Library's curator of wildlife and environmental sounds. What an exciting job title. And uh, Cyril has a background in zoology and library services and has spent the uh, past 15 years looking after the library's uh, amazing collection of over 250,000 species and habitat recordings. And uh, Cyril has worked extensively uh, on projects that encourage the creative reuse of archival, archival content from uh, student video games and short films uh, em to um, emerging filmmakers to interactive storytelling and musical compositions. So welcome to um, all of you. Uh, and um, to go back to uh, our theme and what we are talking about tonight, uh, I'm, I'm very interested about the, the title of our conversation, Digital Nature, and uh, also I can't think of uh, a better time to talk about these two different uh, elements, uh, that, but also very much in the intersecting worlds, uh, digital and nature, uh, and especially um, now going through the, still going through a pandemic, uh, we've been spending so much time uh, online um, in order to connect digitally, but also it's a time when uh, we are probably realizing more than ever how important nature is for our well-being. Um, so um, there's loads of stuff to talk about tonight, uh, but also um, going back to these two worlds, I'm often thinking whether um, going through this crisis, uh, the past kind of over a year actually, uh, but also uh, going through and, um, the environmental changes and climate crisis, if um, now is a time that we might be rethinking our relationship to uh, nature, but also thinking where technology fits uh, into that. And some of these ideas are being explored in a new online artwork um, by Invisible Flock called Faint Signals, which was commissioned by the British Library last year during lockdown. And Faint Signals has been, creating use, has been created using recordings from the library's environmental and wildlife sounds archive. So before we start, uh, we can watch uh, a short film of uh, Faint Signals. Thank you. 
Signals is an artwork entirely drawn from the British Library's extensive nature recording archives. It's a procedurally generated forest that's different for every user that loads it with over three million variations. We wanted to create a meditative experience that really required people to slow down and spend time listening in this imagined woodland. The world itself is, is nondescript in terms of timelines. It exists somewhere between before humankind and potentially after us. Great. Um, so uh, Ben, um, if I may, uh, I would like first to come to you uh, since we've just watched uh, a, a trailer from Faint Signals which is, um, I had uh, had the chance to experience it some time ago, and it's such a beautiful and contemplative piece. And especially, it, I think it, it, it takes a different, it has a different significance right now, uh, especially when, you know, during the pandemic, we have no uh, access to uh, culture, we have no access to nature, like I don't, <laughs> I, I live quite far away. And I would like to, um, to hear like from you, maybe the, the importance of, uh, this work also for you as an artist and as a studio at Invisible Flock, but also in terms of happening now, but also the experience of um, making it happen um, during the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that was very um, exciting for us as a studio who, who had been making work primarily focused on or in and around the environment and our relationship with the natural world for like the past maybe five years um, was actually making a piece of work that was about nature that is right on our doorstep and so um, a lot of our work has sort of tried to tackle perhaps some some seemingly um, bigger but I don't mean bigger in terms of importance but maybe just in terms of uh, perception uh, themes around conservation and around uh, land use and environmental de degradation um, but through our conversations with Ken and with Cheryl uh, we were really able here to kind of make a piece of work that was much much closer to home um, but like you say no less global and no less um, uh, wide-reaching really in, in, in what it's trying to explore and what it's trying to talk about. Uh, we've, we've been making work about nature primarily I think driven by our own personal um, interests, uh, both as, as individual artists in the studio, but also as a direct response to, to what's happening around us. Um, and so being able to then spend time during the pandemic where we had been making these pieces of work that were much more global, they were based out of Indonesia and were designed at, uh, for audiences and physical installations, you know, they're supposed to bring people together to share in these moments. Um, and obviously that's been impossible. And, and so instead to kind of do a complete pivot almost to make this thing that's primarily designed for one person to experience at a time, very slowly, um, which doesn't necessarily have a shape other than the four seasons uh, of the year that, um, that you kind of go through as you, as you participate in it. Um, felt felt like a real privilege because one of the things we were able to do was to let Cheryl's uh, archive material and the work that she she works to catalog and to and to digitize and to preserve and to really let that lead the experience and so by using the sound of nature to drive it and working with that way out we were able to um so I think something, make something that was, I think, far more emotive and far more uh, uh, surprisingly moving than we actually necessarily expected to, um, which, which is great. It's always really exciting when something that you make surprises you. <laughs> I guess it's also something that I found really um, interesting is that uh, trying uh, experiences like this, it makes you uh, realize um, how, um, you, you know, especially now in a, at the time like this, it makes you take a, a step back and realize that there is a whole world that we often um, don't ignore and don't think about. And it is in at our doorstep, as you say. And um, but also, uh, it, it's it, it's something that has uh, had a bit of a devastating uh, kind of feeling to me because it is about loss. It's about realizing um, that a lot of this world is slightly is slowly getting away from us and. Uh, and I would, I would love to hear also from Cyril and Sue here in terms of like maybe to, to share their, their thoughts and experience of the piece as well. And maybe um, if it, it'd be great to hear a little bit about how 
you know, thinking about the archives, for example, and recordings, especially in, in, the, in, in such a vast collection like the British Library, and what it means for um, having pieces that uh, from live, um, you, yeah, organisms from like uh, extinct uh, species that we can't uh, bring back anymore, but this is the only way that we can uh, experience them. I can jump in, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, for me, it was so great to work on this. Um, a lot of the recordings that we were able to provide for the project, I'm very familiar with the recordists and their work. And luckily we have been very busy digitizing a lot of our material. You know, we've got thousands and thousands of recordings. A lot of them were, they've been on tape for, for years. And luckily through a project uh, funded by the Lottery Fund, the Unlocking Our Sound Heritage Project, we've been busy for the past four years rec um, digitizing recordings. And so when I got involved with this, and I knew it was going to be British recordings looking at um, an imaginary woodland, but a British woodland, I thought this is perfect because we've just digitized all of these recordings you know, we've preserved them, but also it really um, it helps us share the recordings as well. So I think if we hadn't have done the digitization work, it would have been really tricky. You know, we, I wouldn't have been able to provide what 300, 400 recordings that we were able to, or Ben was able to put into the piece. And so, you know, being able to that to do that was fantastic. And I think it's made the piece so much richer as well. And we go from, I think the earliest recording was made in 1935 recorded on a wax disc, you know, um, with a mobile recording van driven out into the countryside. And the most recent recording was in was made in 2016. So we've got a very broad range of material as well. So you never know what you're going to encounter. Are you going to hear the hiss and crackle of a very early recording? Or are you going to hear something more contemporary? You never know what you're going to get. And that's one, well, that's one of the such great things about faint signals, one of many great things. I think just quickly to um, what, what, what are the things that we, we try to do when looking at the vastness of the, of the collective material was try to, to create kind of like a procedural system so that every time you logged in, you wouldn't necessarily have the same experience. So anytime you log in to, to play or to experience how, however you want to describe interacting with faint signals, you, you could get one of, I think it's something like 300 million different permutations because we're creating, we created these vast data sets using the sound recordings as our starting point. So like if a sound, if a sound file was recorded in a pine forest, we retro engineered all of the things that we imagine, all of the biomes that we imagine would be in place to allow for that sound recording to happen. They will get put into a system, which then generates itself randomly every time. So you always have different types of archetypal forests with different types of soil, with different types of trees, which then informs the different types of animal recording we might pull in. And so we've kind of got all these things rubbing up against each other, uh, which does create this really beautiful unpredictability to it. And, and there was just one really quick thing about the digitization, um, which was kind of a mistake, but actually became one of our favorite things was we had all the files and at the beginning of every file, the sound recordist or the archivist slates it. So they say out loud, this is so-and-so and this is what I'm recording. And, and sometimes this is really beautiful. I can't remember which recorder it is, Cheryl, who talks at length to describe the environment around him. And it's really, really lovely. Mm -hmm. And initially I was like, well, how on earth am I gonna, you know, get trim 300 files? You know, like, can we do it algorithmically? Can we just guess? So, and so we just put the files in unedited to begin with. And actually it was this really beautiful thing where shedding the desire to like simulate nature and instead going, this is about playing back these sound files in a way that invites you in in a completely different way and meant that we left the slating. And it brings this really beautiful human connection, I think, and the fact that like these are people yeah. who stood in a forest recording these sounds. Um, and that became one of our favorite things. And it was just a mistake that that just stuck. And, you know, I, I remember Cheryl, you, you pointed out in the first place and we were like, oh my God, yeah, it's actually a really beautiful thing. But it works so well, you know, mm. it really gives the sense of, you know, the sounds have come from an archive. They've, they've come from nature originally, but they have, they've come uh, from the archive and it's really nice to hear the voices of the recordists, you know, because they're usually silent in their recordings. Um, they don't want to be part of it. So, you you know, you wouldn't know they were there. And that's what's nice as well. We have the metadata in the piece as well. So you get to see their names, you know, and normally you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have that kind of information. So to be able to get that little human element um, is, is wonderful. That sounds great, actually. And um, 
Yeah, it's I I love um, the, this process that you are talking about as well. And uh, I mean, I'm I'm not sure uh, how if these would be something that comes differently. Like, yeah, is experienced by audiences in in the piece as well. But as but it, it's something that I find really interesting in terms of experiencing nature online as well. And Sue, I would love to hear from you as well um, as someone who has written so much about. Uh, both the digital and nature, and to, to hear your thoughts uh, about uh, experiencing faint signals as well. Well, it, it was really interesting for me to, to I've listened to it two or three times um, to faint signals because it fits in with a lot of the research that I've done. Um, initially carried out in, in the 80s around that time by environmental psychologists um, who were really just looking at how nature affects people, how it affects their well-being, um, their physical and emotional well-being and so on. And um, interestingly, they didn't usually go out into nature to do this testing. They often would just show their subjects, um, a film or perhaps a sound recording. I haven't come across that, but I'm sure they did. Um, or um, a, even a painting would be enough to um, get results from individuals to actually measure their slowing heart rate or lower blood pressure and so on. So they could actually prove that well-being was happening, that, that this was having good effects on, on people health-wise. Um, but then we were in a period where there was uh, quite a lot of friction between people who were interested in real nature, red in tooth and claw, getting out there and being muddy and actually interacting with nature. Um, and the other side, if you like, the computer literate internet digital side, who um, the two would have nothing to do with. They would be two very different and opposing cultures. And what I've been interested in looking at is actually how they come together um, and how you do experience nature through the digital, whether it's audio or uh, video or virtual reality um, and seeing how what kind of effects that has on you. So what was interesting for me listening to Faint Signals was that one of the... Um, states that was um, kind of developed during this environmental psychology research was the notion of what they called nearby nature. And nearby nature can be the tiniest suggestion of nature. It could be, you know, you live in a city, you've got hardly any greenery around you, but out on the street, there's a half dead tree with a few leaves on it. And that is that would count as nearby nature. And that will connect in with that ancient biophilic brain and produce a modicum of well being and of feeling better, even from the suggestion of a forest through a small tree that's not very well. <laughs> um, and hearing the bird song like that seemed to me a similar thing, a similar aspect of nearby nature, where you're only getting suggestions and they're all building up together to provide an entire experience. Um, and I'm sure that if you did test it by watching people's heart rate and blood pressure and so on, when they experience faint signals, it would be quite interesting to see um, how that worked and whether you got any useful results from it. So I think there's been a huge shift from the early days of environmental psychology, who were very, if you like, kind of anti-tech, to where we are now, particularly after COVID, um, when suddenly people are realizing that actually you can experience nature through technology and have just as an uh, authentic experience um, in, in terms of the way that it affects you as if you were you know, out in real forest. Obviously it's not the same, I'm not saying it is the same, but a lot of the benefits can be actually almost equally powerful. Um, and virtual reality, I can talk about that later if, if you like, has been shown to be even more powerful than, for example, watching a Richard Attenborough documentary on TV. Um, so there's a lot of research into that area. And I think this project fits really well into that, that kind of mode of thought. 
That's fascinating. It's definitely um, talking from personal experience during the pandemic and the lockdown, I have definitely um, found myself to reach out for online content that is more related to nature, like sounds, nature sounds, or uh, even the these kind of like citizen uh, science um, yeah. uh, apps, online apps or websites where you can just spend hours just, you know, observing nature and uh, yeah, where not many things happen at times, but it's great to to have this uh, this space to get uh, almost erase the space between yourself and the screen and get lost uh, in in there. And I wonder if there is any or if we will know later on of um, uh, research or like stats about like how if this has been like a general kind of uh, case. So, but I just I wanted to go back to what something that struck me from um, faint signals and there was this idea of, of loss as well. And I was wondering if uh, experiences like these um, can make us, or if, if they can work as some sort of like a wake up calls as well to, to think about, uh, you know, what we are losing slowly. And it was really interesting also during the, the pandemic and the lockdowns that, um, people like we had to slow down and we, we saw everywhere all of these photos, but also videos of animals taking over as well, the, the world and where we, we had been kind of, uh, you know, just taking a step back. So it'd be really um, uh, interesting to, uh, to, to think a little bit about that in terms of um, the, what role art can play, but also in terms of, um, Institu arts institutions, cultural institutions and collections like the British Library in terms of like, how can they um, help us engage with uh, where we are at the moment and the, the, this kind of crisis, the, the environmental crisis that we've been going through. I don't know who wants to go first, but it's, uh, it's yeah, a question I mean, for all of you. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose I, I can speak to, 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 to faint signals maybe and, and our, pra our practice more generally, or our thoughts around it, um, I, th I think it's a really it's a really fascinating one because I think there's always this fear or this concern about aestheticizing uh, environmental collapse, um, and I think you know we have already not we as a as a as a as a kind of a society or certainly kind of you know mainstream internet driven Western society, Western's a lazy term, but you, you know what I mean, um, uh, have, have, are beginning to develop aesthetics for it, you know? And I think, you know, you find aesthetics that are the, the, the beautiful classical music of an Attenborough documentary over the sad picture of a whale or uh, um, Ludovico Einaudi playing piano on a mountain iceberg or, you know, and, and, and these are all very beautiful images and I think they're important images and, and culture I think has an incredibly crucial role to play in, in how we approach um, the next decades uh, and, and you know and, and it is major cultural images and major cultural moments or cultural touchstones that do spark change and that do make people have give people a shared language of which to talk about both uh, both ways to, to a future but also just with dealing with uh, and and coping with loss because I think there is something inherently tragic. I mean, you know, you listen to um, it's the old thing, isn't it? Of like all the all the animals in your favorite childhood movies are all dead now, and uh, <laughs> and you know, and there's something in that in in a lot of the you know the 1920s sound recording that Cheryl talked about is beautiful. And then you know you think about how every single living living thing apart from the trees that was recorded in that recording is no longer alive, um, and and I think that's that impermanence is is um is is being amplified constantly and i i, I think for, for us with with making work in this sort of general area it's really important that we're not just pointing at things like i think there's enough like it's too late for that it's too late just to go climate change and point at it as in i think we now as artists or as as makers as anybody really as scientists as engineers as cooks as whatever it is that you do uh, as just a person, you know, your, your actions and your choices should be actively participating, I think, in 
considering sustainable futures. Um, so a way that we try and do that is we try and make work in collaboration with um, either scientists or researchers or archives, as is the case of the British Library, uh, to, to try and make sure that the, the, these aesthetic experiences that we're creating are grounded and are connecting themselves to reality. Um, you know, I, I don't think faint signals has a call to arms necessarily above and beyond making you feel emotionally close to uh, ecosystems and to species and to creatures who a lot of people have not been able to be close to because of the pandemic, but also because we, we are increasingly divorced from nature in that way. Um, and and, and so, so I think it's, it's definitely trying to do that. Um, and I suppose the last point of reflection is that uh, with hand in hand with my worry about aestheticizing climate collapse is also that we're therefore aestheticizing it through the lenses of a sort of, you know, global north culture, whereas, you know, the people who are experiencing the brunt of it live in the global south and, and you know, there are, and, and so, the, the, those cultural moments that we create or that cultural language that we're developing for climate collapse needs to actually incorporate all of those voices and all of those aesthetics and languages. Uh, and so, so yeah. Cyril, you, you were going to say something or? <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say that uh, using sound to highlight um, issues around or threatened species or, you know, potential loss is not a new thing. Um, one of the strongest examples comes back, goes back to the 1970s with um, the very famous, probably the most famous and most popular wildlife commercial record, Songs of the Humpback Whale, which was um, contains recordings that were made by a scientist, uh, Roger Payne. And he showed that whales were able to sing, you know, they had a very complex social system. And at the time, humpback whales and many whales were on the verge of extinction you know industrial um hunting had just driven them to the brink and he used those recordings to highlight or to raise awareness about the species and their social systems and how we should not be persecuting and um capital records picked up those recordings and you know they would normally put out pop stars you know they wouldn't why would they put out whale song but they did and it was millions of copies were sold and that was really um pivotal pivotal in the uh, save the whale movement you know, so just a few recordings he made with a hydrophone, you know, in the ocean, brought was well, saved humpback whales from extinction. So there's a lot of power in in sound recordings, and that's a nice, that's a lovely example because they're recordings that were made for science, which then crossed that divide and went into culture, popular culture, and then spread out. You know, so it wasn't just confined to scientific research; it went much further than that, and that's what we like. Well, that's what we do with a lot of our recordings in the archive as well. You know, they, they may come in from a scientist, but then they may go out and be used by an artist or a musician or an, a teacher or, you know, there's, there's so much potential there. And, and what's interesting about the, your whale song story and also about bird song in general is that it's kind of raw. It's real, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And um, Ben was talking about aestheticizing um, global uh, climate change. But I think it's inevitable that we will do that because ever since nature came to TV when I was growing up in the 50s, um, Nature has been more and more aestheticized and storified. Um, and this is why I, I do have quite a problem with a lot of the nature programs that we're also addicted to these days. It's not real. Most of it is not real. And that information is coming out more and more leaking out about the way that the blue planet was made, et cetera, et cetera. All the setup scenes, all the cutting, um, it's storified. And that's what we've got used to. And so that's always in the back of my head where we say how much we enjoy watching nature on TV, because most of the time it's been cut and edited and, and rearranged and faked in some cases to give us the story of nature that we like. And, and now that same thing is happening when we think about climate change. It's, it's all in stories, which is partly why I've, I've got really interested in webcam nature, mm. um, because that is real. <laughs> um, I mean, obviously there are certain kind of artifice aspects to, to that as well, but it's a million miles away from, from a beautifully curated TV series. Um, and so I think with the, the, 
the kind of asceticizing aspect. It's something that people need to wake up to and be honest with themselves. Are they prepared to watch real nature or listen to real nature sounds rather than something that's been beautified for them, for their consumption? That, that's really interesting, uh, Sue. I was thinking exactly the same earlier, all these, um, the, uh, these webcams that I, I also mentioned earlier in terms of these windows to, to nature yeah. and, uh, and, and they are not, and there is this curated content that is missing. And you, I think we were saying before that you, you, you sit there for hours and nothing happens. Yes. <laughs> and it's so far <laughs> away from what we're used to watch yeah. on, uh, on, on TV programs. Yeah. And I, I wonder if, this if the way that we might be um, using internet to kind of experience nature might be changing how we uh, interact with na or how yeah or, or our perception in terms of like nature as well and this yeah. kind of beautified or like curated version of nature I, th I think it is because um i always think of the story of the the eagle and the kitten and the webcam um which was which happened a few years ago and was widely reported in the states where as you've probably seen lots of these animal webcams have been carefully set up so that we can watch around the world 24 seven. And then people talk in the chat rooms about what they're seeing and so on, and they all become very connected. Um, and in this particular case, it was an eagle's nest. And the, 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 the audience, if you like, had been watching this eagle nest for weeks. They'd seen the chicks um, burst out of their shells. They'd seen the parents coming back and forth and feeding the chicks. And it was really cute and everybody loved it until the day that one of the eagles brought back a white kitten. Yeah. And that they were not happy with that. <laughs> and I remember seeing one woman said, I don't tune in to see this, but <laughs> you should. <laughs> um, and then, then you get into the thing of um, messaging the rangers and saying, you've got to go up there, you've got to rescue the kitten, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but uh, that's when you have to realize that this is reality. Yeah. And you, would, you wouldn't see that unless it was storified on TV. Um, but it's a big leap to make and people yeah. might not want to make it. So I think what you're talking about, it um, also brings me back to uh, one thing that I remind always myself about technology as well in terms of, you know, just using technology or using artificial intelligence or different kind of, uh, you know, emerging technologies to kind of create a less realistic version of things as well. And also, um, it, it's something that since we're talking about these two things, digital and nature, I, I, I can't help but think about, um, you know, how what we were saying at the very beginning, how much it, it borrows from each other and how much technology borrows from nature as well. And I think yeah. Sue, you have done quite a lot of work on that as well. But um, it's, it's really um, one thing that we can't also forget about is that how the you know, how physical the online space is, how physical, you know, what happens in between uh, our screens, like from, from where I, I stand to where you, uh, all of you stand as well. There's uh, a very kind of material world as well, right? Yeah. That we forget, we often forget about. Uh, but before we continue, I just wanted also to very quickly uh, remind our audiences to please send their questions in and we will be taking questions in a few minutes. But uh, yeah, but to go to go back to that um, uh, shared language and uh, between these two spaces, like the uh, technology, uh, digital world, cyberspace, but also nature, na uh, natural space. Um, I, I, I would love to hear your uh, everybody's thoughts uh, on, on that as well. Like, why are we drawn to uh, this uh, to, to to nature metaphors when it comes to to technology and we, we name things then the way that we name things do you want me to jump in on that since that's my yeah, area yes, please yes <laughs> um, well i i started off doing a lot of research into that into why we use nature metaphors um like you know web stream cloud um, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots and lots of them to, to talk about a space which is completely abstract. And that was where my, my research for my book, Technobiophilia started. Um, and 
it seemed, I decided that it seemed to me that if you're going into a completely abstract space as they were in the, in the early nineties, um, you have to kind of find things that feel like something that you know. And I think that's why early um, cyber explorers, if you like, um, coined all of these different nature-based names. There's lots and lots of them. And, um, and we kind of got used to that. But today, I think it's a bit different. And in fact, there was an article just in The Guardian, I think it was today, about research that's been done that shows that people now think of their mobile phones as home. And very interesting research talking about how you've actually got everything that you, that you value at home is in your phone. All the people you care about, um, you know, the things that you want to know about, the information in your world, all of that is in your phone. So you're carrying your home around in your phone, which was another interesting way to think about place. They didn't mention nature in that respect, but um, I thought it was quite an interesting leaping off point for this kind of conversation. Um, so I think it's because we humans like recognizable things and they will name and conceptualize them in terms of something they already know. Um, and then that kind of led on from there to people using it unconsciously on screensavers and so on, um, because they, they liked them, not realizing that intuitively they were choosing nature metaphors and nature images to, for their digital world. Mm. I won't go on more, It'll, I'll be here forever. <laughs> I'll, I'll let... Uh, yeah, I'll let maybe Sarah and Ben to share their thoughts here. If you if you have anything to, if you want to share anything on this. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, anything I, I've always sort of assumed. I mean, pretty much kind of what Sue is saying in a way, but like yeah, the idea that we 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 find, um, almost like markers for ourselves and like somehow using natural terms of things, um gives us a a sense of the place of these of these weird worlds that we're still working out how to inhabit and how to be in and it, it kind of anchors them in some way perhaps or you know it just kind of gives us this sense that this is an organic continuum you know it's kind of it's still part of of everything else and what we're doing is natural even though if it is 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 you know an artifice that we're creating for ourselves um although is it you know because also the not to go too far into this because it's a bit of a, an endless you know black hole but also you know there's a degree to which technology is in a way based on nature and it's you know in mm -hmm. in its in its materiality and, and and its use has an effect on nature and so actually you know it is part of a a a continuum of rocks in the ground turning into a laptop in front of you turning into god knows what in the future when they eventually break down so 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 you know at no point are we ever devoid of nature we we still perform and use technology within the context of nature um so 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 yeah that, that you can't necessarily separate them maybe i don't think but 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 it's interesting that that's who talked about that idea that they used that you know there was in the early stages suddenly dichotomy you know the kind of uh, yeah. uh virtual reality um william gibson style thing you know you were in a different world entirely yeah. um which is very interesting you know i think increasingly we're realizing there is no other there is no other world that we can inhabit entirely, you know. And, and I think it's been quite destructive in some ways, that early dichotomy, because, you know, we not so long ago, we were all thinking about having to choose between our phones or going for a walk. You shouldn't take your phone on a walk. That's bad. Um, you know, you need to experience pure nature, whatever that is. But I think that the pandemic has taught us otherwise. I think a lot of people have changed their minds about that, that difference. And what I'm interested in really is people living an integrated life with their technology and the natural world. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the pandemic has taken us a long way towards that. It's been a lifesaver for so many people, technology, you know, being able to experience nature whether it's through webcams or sound recordings or virtual tours or whatever um without that i think many people would have would have really struggled you know because you can't yeah. physically go anywhere but at least you can yeah. use your laptop or your phone or even if it's just photographs it's something it's, it's because we're so used to using it anyway you know we use it for our speak to our families we use it for work we use it for all of these different things then be using it to experience nature and to you know gain enjoyment or 
uh, to calm ourselves or to distract ourselves. Yeah. It's just second, it's becoming second nature. It doesn't mean that it's replacing, you know, the wonder that you get when you go into a woodland, you hear a dawn chorus, or you see the, you know, you hear the sound of the sea in real life. But it's, it's as long as you don't just totally rely on that, you know, you do recognize that nothing quite beats going out in, into nature. But having that as a backup when you need yeah. it. It's, it's being conscious and aware of the world around you the digital world and the nature, natural world. Um, I'm trying an experiment at the moment, actually, I can't show you from where I'm sitting, but I'm growing lettuces behind my laptop. Um, I've set up my desk so that there's a, a box of lettuces at the back and I can watch them grow and I could eat them if I want. <laughs> and it's just, it's a silly little thing, but it's being conscious and thinking, well, how can I bring more nature into my digital life? Yeah. Um, I can have a plant on the desk, I could grow lettuces, I could have plants behind me for Zoom calls. Um, yeah, it's being aware, mm. with, which you... your piece is making people aware. Oh, Sorry. Uh, no, no, I was just thinking while you were talking, like all of you, you were saying your, you were sharing your thoughts about like a, a, a project called Low Tech Magazine. I don't know if you have come across it, but it's not, it's not new. It's been around for a while, but it's, uh, it, it's basically a solar powered uh, website. And it's really interesting because it has, <laughs> when, when you, it, it means that uh, w sometimes it might not work because the, <laughs> because the weather hasn't allowed for it to work. And it's really interesting. It's an interesting way to have this to, un to have this connection because it gives you real time data about the weather, but also forecasting in terms of where, whether you will be able to access it or not to access <laughs> the information. So I thought it was a really interesting way, uh, uh, yeah, fascinating project to kind of uh, think about, uh, you know, f natural phenomena or weather in in through like te technology. Um, but yeah, but we have also, uh, I'm, I'm going to bring in very quick, very soon, uh, some of the questions because we have quite a few interesting questions that, and um, we did, we did um, answer some of them, but a couple of people have been asking about um, also the experience of smells uh, as well and mm -hmm. uh, of, of different uh, nature uh, environments and if we can remember and whether we could remember at uh, smells like looking at pictures or <laughs> or being online so i don't know i, I don't know if you have any um uh, any uh, suggestions or like if you can point uh, to any studies or maybe artworks that um that use kind of uh, smells in that way i haven't i haven't so i'm not sure if any of you have <laughs> there's an artist who uh, made a perfume um, of the smell of petrichor, which is, you know, the smell oh, yes. after rain has just fallen. And, and they kind of recreated that in a perfume, mm. uh, which is quite beautiful and, and very specific, I think. Um, but I have a terrible sense of smell. So <laughs> I'm maybe not the best person to ask. <laughs> Well, I can't remember the artist's name either, I'm sorry. But yeah, yeah, but it's called Petrichor. I think the perfume yeah. is called Petrichor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is a beautiful word as well. Yeah. But it's interesting also that sometimes even you can you you can bring to your mind smells from um, sounds or from being yeah. in a place. I don't know, it, happen, it happens to me. I don't know if it is something um, unusual, but, <laughs> but I have experienced it a few, a few times. So I, yeah. I mean, it's definitely something I think, you know, my early, my personal... I think smell is so powerful as a personal emotion. I think it's very interesting that, I mean, perfumers would disagree and probably cooks and chefs, but like, it's something that's quite hard to, to wield in a way, isn't it? Or I always think of it as quite hard to wield, you know, to be like, I'm going to recreate the smell of, I don't know, X, Y, or Z experience, or, or it feels, it feels like it'd be something quite um, hard to wrangle to kind of reproduce that that emotional connection you have to it. The, the funny thing is actually, you can reproduce it quite easily in writing. Mm. Mm. And, you know, I used to teach a lot of creative writing classes and it was an easy one as a prompt for writing is just to get people to think about a smell or better still present them with a smell or a piece of fruit or whatever. And all these memories will come up it's amazing. Um, and then, you know, you, you write it down. In fact, it's easier to, to evoke smell through words probably 
than the other art forms. That's a gross generalization, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's that connection between smell and language is really interesting though, because I'm always fascinated how with wine, for example, if you smell it, uh, you often, there's something in there and it's not until somebody tells you what that smell is mm. that your brain, or at least my brain, makes the connection between language mm. and olfactory senses. So it's almost like my brain didn't have the necessary information to go, that's a thing that you know, and that's a smell, and this is how they connect. And I always find that really interesting that it's language is the missing piece yeah. for you to go, <laughs> oh, that's a raspberry or whatever, you know, and I always find that really fascinating. Mm. Yeah. Um, I just, I wanted to bring in another question. Sorry, I don't know if, um, so, Cyril, you wanted to uh, to jump on this or... No, it's fine. <laughs> so um, Paul Steer uh, from our audience was uh, saying that it's interesting that we think of ourselves uh, divorced from nature when we are of nature. We are made of the same stuff. Do you all think that othering nature is at the root of our problems? And I think we did touch on some of these um, issues before some of these ideas, but uh, it, it'd be great to, to go back to that and uh, share your, your thoughts. Mm. We always talk about ourselves like us and then nature, you know, there's always this, se this separation, but, you know, clearly we're not separate and, you know, we're all living on this one planet and we're all rel reliant on each other. And so, you know, we have to be so careful what we're doing because of the impact that we're having, certainly, because we're not, it's not us and them. You know, it's 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 all it's all of us, all the species on the planet. And we've all got our place, and we all have to, you know, coexist and work together in a you know in a way to ensure our survival. So it shouldn't really we shouldn't be thinking about it like like that. I think more and more that people are becoming aware of that issue with you know us and then the humans and then everything else. Um, and yeah, we're, we're pulling it back. Hopefully, I would hope so. I think um, there's a, a writer called, I think, Roderick Nash, who wrote a book about the American wilderness, where he addressed the, the role of the human, if you like, in the natural world. And at the end of it, he makes a really good suggestion, which I, I think is worth considering, which is that he suggests that the whole of the planet Earth should have certain reservations where the humans lived, and then the rest of it is just left. And that's where you know, animals can and plants can do whatever, but to confine the humans to reduce their impact on the rest of the planet. I mean, obviously it's not possible, but uh, personally, I don't think humans can ever really um, take their place in, in the rest of the world because they're such interventionists. They, they would always be somehow moving away from everything else. Mm. I'm quite pessimistic about that, really. Do you think I'm wrong, Ben? <laughs> I don't. No, I, mean, I, I don't think you're wrong necessarily at all. I, I think it's so. I mean, it's such a it's such a dense topic, isn't it? Because I think, you know, I think we are definitely we have definitely othered ourselves from nature. But I think the way in which we have done that varies so radically all around the world as well. And and you know, by driven by different forces uh, of market of revolution of capitalism of colonialism and all of that and I think you know and so I think the way that that otherness takes shape is so different but and I, and I think yeah I mean I would tend to agree certainly that I I wonder whether we need to find a way to understand ourselves as not other whilst accepting that we cannot be part mm -hmm. we also are probably beyond the point where we can return to this sort of like primal um utopia perhaps you know and actually it's about how do we in the numbers that we are with the needs that we have as societies find ways to 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 to, to preserve what we still have I suppose you know and, and so so I think is, is it Half Earth the book or is that a different book because there's a book called Half Earth as well I think where he suggests where the, the author suggests that half the earth be given over mm -hmm. as a natural reserve and the other half but that one's quite recent that was only like a couple of years yeah ago. no this is this is uh, yeah. 10 yeah. or 20 years old right yeah yeah no so 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 yeah but again that idea of going okay so this is the line and you know no further yeah. <laughs> uh, but then I suppose the one thing that is really fascinating about that is that we've been doing quite a lot of work with uh various kind of indigenous groups and by which we would define people who who work or who are heavily dependent on the land and you know in places like the Amazon for example it's very fascinating because actually 
you know, it has never really been completely human free. You know, there were city, there were there were tribes, you know, had cities the size of New York, you know, historically and and and, and maybe not quite that big, but big. Um, and, and so, so it, there is this notion that actually nature was all fine and getting along and then the humans arrived. I, I, you know, humans have always been there yeah. to a degree. And, and I think the idea that that it's, you know, you can just leave it is also slightly is slightly complicated as well yeah. and, and and has some practical logistical stuff you know like th there was um there's, there's a um uh in in indonesia there was a uh, some rainforest that had been cut down and some people we were working with there were explaining that they can't just let it be grow on its own because the ferns grow faster than the trees and so if they just let the forest grow then they'll just have ferns and they won't have trees so they have to do this management and now obviously they're having to manage land that has previously been destroyed by logging and human activity so mm. You know, it's like yeah. you're actively trying to heal something or at least try and restore it a bit. But that idea that we can maybe just step away. I don't know. I don't know. It's so vast and so complex. <laughs> but the othering, the othering of ourselves at a spiritual level and emotional level, I think is definitely the problem. I think, you know, yeah. whether we could ever non-materially other ourselves, I don't know. But I think emotionally and spiritually, the othering is so, I think, you know, the root of so much is wrong about how we treat nature but also how we treat each other you know because that extractive way of thinking carries through to how we treat other humans sorry that was long <laughs> no I, absolutely and that's what i was thinking about ben as well in terms of what you touched on like early on in the conversation in terms of the work that you do in uh, like beyond the, the the west and how we uh, you know think often differently about nature as well to uh, people who are in the other side of the world or like uh, you know non-western cultures as well so, so which which is something that I think it's quite big to go into this conversation yeah. but it's really it's really interesting to kind of uh, yeah think this about these different perspectives uh, as well um, but uh, that takes me to another question by uh, Marcus which um, says uh, asking if um, people might be curating a small world for for the for the, themselves by choosing which digital mediated people to relate to or experiences to consume, uh, and uh, he's kind of bringing as an example uh, the the person absorbed uh, absorbed in their phone uh, while indifferent to kind of to what happens uh, around them. So. Um, so he says, like, for all that the digital world gives people choice, is there also scope for digitally created surprises that people might not necessarily choose? That's faint signals, though, isn't it, really? <laughs> I, I was about to say, yeah, this is what... This is what Thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> <laughs> because you don't know what you're going to expect. So, oh, well, you know, we don't, you don't know what to expect. You just go into it and you could, you could use it three times a day you wouldn't have the same experience you could do it every day you wouldn't have the same experience so that's that's the beauty of faint signals you've cracked it Ben <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah totally thank you Cheryl <laughs> I think as well and I'm sure Sue maybe will have more to say I think we often conflate like digital as well with what are actually consumer experiences being pushed on us so people say digital to mean Facebook they're really different things like digital is actually such a blank slate of opportunity and of creativity and has been historically, you know, and, and I think that's what we try and do as practitioners in that space. Uh, and so, so digital really, you know, or in your, in your curation work, Irene, as well, you know, you, you really showcase that, you know, digital is not just these walled gardens that we have been corralled into live our lives like Google and Facebook and Instagram and all of that. It is actually a, a you know, it's, it's a series of protocols and languages that make machines do things. And within that lies incredible power and magic and potential, I think. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And for me, this is where um, I, I always go back to why, um, you know, cultural institutions, but also artists uh, and art play such an important role in terms of um, helping us um, yeah, see a different world, actually. And it's the same with digital, because many people might think of, as you were saying, Ben, of digital experiences in a very specific way, but there's so much more uh, to that as well. And um, yeah, and, and I think this is where uh, I find like fascinating the, the work that uh, obviously artists do, but also the, the role that uh, 
institute, arts institutions, but also, yeah, places like the, the British Library, but also I'm thinking of, um, you know, examples like the, the Horniman Museum, for example, like where they, the, they have this project Coral, and it's such a place that you wouldn't, you know, th thinking about um, creating innovative uh, coral reproductive research, for example, to, to develop the techniques to, to stimulate coral reproduction. So it's things like that, that you wouldn't, expect to find in a, in, in, a, in a cultural institution or even like thinking about uh, ZKM in Karlsruhe with their critical zones, um, ambitious exhibition and all these conversations about climate change as well. So, so, so it, it, it's great that we have these experiences out there to, uh, to, to show us a different world. Speaking of coral, don't they use sound to heal coral? Haven't they found that if you play the sounds of healthy coral on an unhealthy coral reef, it helps bring... Yes it, does. yes, it does. Yeah, you play the sounds of a healthy coral with all the sounds of the fish and the invertebrates, and that attracts nearby uh, species. And then they come and they find a new coral and think, oh, I quite like it here, I might stay. And so they, uh, yeah, they repopulate wow. it. No, you're right, they do. I think just to go back to the mobile phone thing, I think we have to be careful here. I mean, one thing is it's, it's very interesting to know why we love our phones so much. I would really like to know that. And I think it will be discovered. I mean, it's a very specific thing when you see people. It's, it's kind of annoying. We all know it, even though when we're doing it ourselves, it's annoying, you know. But people are like that with books. People are like that listening to music. Um, people are like that looking at nature and being transported somewhere else. And I just think we just need to, you know, get, get this in context. I mean, 100, 150 years ago um, in the Victorian era, the idea of novels, they were thinking corrupted people's minds and, you know, they shouldn't be allowed and so on. And it was only about 14, um, 1400, 1500 when people, most people could read and write probably later than that. So before that time, most people were illiterate and the way that they experienced and communicated the world was completely different to how it was in 1700 or 1800. Things change and we change with them. Um, and so I think you, you're going down a, a dead end rabbit hole to, 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 to think about the, the kind of the bad things that mobiles do to our brains because they also do some very interesting things too. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, coming from um, also a, a museum world and having worked for years uh, at, at the Vienna, it was something that we were saying all the time in terms of yeah. uh, suddenly we could um, see young people interacting with the collections in a completely different way, for example, and seeing things that, you know, we couldn't uh, find or like we couldn't see through their eyes. So it was, it's really, I totally agree with you. I mean, we, yeah, the, we always learn and find new things and new ways to, uh, to interact with, uh, with, with devices. And, it, and it's great to, to, to look at these, um, you know, in genuine ways in, in, in how people use their devices or like anything, basically any tools. Yeah. So uh, we are, I, I'm not sure if we have maybe, yeah, we have one more question, but um, it's uh, which is something that we have um, said maybe already, but I just wanted to bring it up maybe as a closing point. Uh, so Jean was asking um, if digital nature is more for people between to get a balance between nature and cyberspace, or if it's and, and enjoying nature online, or if it's more, as a, if, we, if we can think of it as a way to inspire and awake people to go back to real nature. <laughs> I think we've already spoken about this, but maybe, maybe we can uh, yeah, bring some closing notes because uh, we are I'm aware of time <laughs> as well. So I don't know who wants, if, if anyone wants to um, yeah, share anything on that. Well, I could say very quickly that there's no such thing as going back to real nature because there's no such thing as real nature. <laughs> so integration mm -hmm. it's kind of all of those things as well isn't it I mean it depends on how you want to interact well it depends on how you want to use technology some people 
if you want to create things, you know, using using sound recordings uh, like in my collection, or maybe you just want to have a more passive role. I mean, it's very individual. I would have thought, you know, how how you how you what what path you follow uh, through that world. Ben, do you have any closing note on that? Any <laughs> closing statements? Um... No, I mean, I'm not sure I do. I, I, I think I, I agree with with both Sue and, and Shell very much. I think that the idea of dichotomies is is perhaps the wrong way to approach it, because I think it is. It, a, it's a losing battle, but e, I, I don't think it's a useful way to look at it. Actually, I think, you know, we have a tremendous opportunity for enrichment and for greater proximity and, and participation and perception of the world around us. And I think we should we, we, sh we should embrace that. We should become more literate with how we use our technology, not less. Great, thank you all so much. Um, Sue, uh, Cyril and Ben, thank you very much for your uh, brilliant insights and, and thoughts tonight. And uh, I would like also to say a big thank you to the British Library for having us here tonight. And of course, uh, our great uh, audience and their very interesting questions. And uh, have a great evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining. <laughs>